Hello and welcome back to our bookshop in Tring. I'm Ben Morehouse. So we've got another author interview and we're talking to award-winning author and journalist Felicity Cloak. Uh, her latest book is entitled One More Croissant for the Road and uh, involves a tour of France tasting food, which is uh, I'm sure a job we'd all like to do. Um, Felicity is talking to Jamie Fury. Thank you very much, Ben. Uh, today we are joined by Felicity Cloak to talk about her new book or newish book in paperback, One More Croissant for the Road, which is a kind of gastronomic uh, tour de France, uh, where she cycles around around France, taking in some of the uh, country's most famous regions and their, their wonderful food. It was described by Diana Henry as joyful, life-affirming, greedy. I loved it. And I, I did too. I read it last month and I in this time where we can't travel and there's no Tour de France, it filled kind of two holes, but it made me absolutely starving and um, Googling where I can get certain French, French dishes and delicacies around the Hertfordshire area with, uh, with, with not much success. So it'd be great, Felicity, if we could just kick off by you just telling us a bit about the book and telling us about this, this amazing journey you went on around France. Bonjour. Um, so yeah, I decided to do the book. So I write uh, in my day job. I write recipes, um, and in general, I've done a I've done a column for the Guardian for the last decade called How to Make the Perfect. And you know, it's very it's very much food based, but I don't get to see the foods in their context. In you know, as they say in France, their terroir. Um, and I've always loved France. We used to, used to go there um, on holiday from Hertfordshire um, when I was a kid. Every single year we'd go camping in France. Um, and in 2017, a friend of mine was moving, who's half French, was moving back to her family farm in the south of France and uh, having had enough of London. And she said, oh, I'm going to cycle there. She didn't own a bike in London. She could barely cycle a bike and said, do you want to come with me? And I actually, I couldn't think of a better reason <laughs> I couldn't think of anything better I was doing in August. Um, a happy day when travel was free. And so I went with her and I realised that France, even though it's a country that I thought I knew well, um, there's actually so much of it between the, the holiday areas, which is was to me undiscovered. And I thought being on a bike is just the perfect way to see a country because it's... Um, it's sort of fast enough that you get to see the landscape changing. So if you're cycling down the length of France, you go from um, butter on the table to olive oil. You go from people drinking cider and beer to wine. You know, the roof tiles change from slate to terracotta, all of that stuff. Um, but it's slow enough that you get to notice those details. So I think in a car, even if you're off the auto route, you're whizzing past, you're going to your destination. Whereas for that, the, the journey was the destination. It sounds corny, but it's true. And I started to think maybe there's something, maybe there's something in that. Maybe there's a book about France, a country that loads of us Brits feel like we know, um, but just taking it a little bit slower and staying away from, from most of the hot spots. And the more I thought about it when I was on the bike in 2017, the more I thought I really want to do this. Um, and so, yeah, the next summer I set off on my bike from uh, Portsmouth Harbour and cycled from um, St. Malo in Brittany uh, right the way around France, so down to Biarritz um, in the Pyrenees, and then along to Nice on the Côte d'Azur, and then up via the Alps, I had to do an Alp, um, and then to Strasbourg on the German border, and then back to Paris. So, yeah, it was uh, it was uh, seven seven amazing weeks. It's quite the trip. I remember when I was reading it, I'm a cyclist, and if I have had any sort of big or rich meal on the Saturday, there's no chance for me cycling on a Sunday. And then you did that and cycled up and out. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> don't know how that happened. Um, I just think I would have stopped halfway up and... Um, yeah, I'm not saying that I didn't stop on the way up the Alp, um, but I just felt like I had to... So the, the, the way the book is structured is it's 21 stages, like the Tour de France itself, um, but instead of a stage being centred around, you know, a famous climb or a sprint, or whichever city is bunged to the organizers a load of cash. Um, I structured it around 21 sort of iconic dishes of um, French cuisine. And of course I had to have tartiflet. I love tartiflet, you know, potatoes, cheese, what is not to like about that? But to eat tartiflet, it meant I had to go to the Alps and to go to the Alps and not do a climb felt like a dereliction of duty. Um, but as you say, I did have a tartiflet and a massive ice cream at the end, so. Uh, it was worth it. Well said. 
knowing that we were doing this interview today, I was in London yesterday and I tried to go and get a tartar flat from a place on Exmouth Market. It was closed. I was like, devastated that it wasn't. <laughs> I could have sorted you out. <laughs> I, I would be thinking, I really should go to a tartar flat right now. So in the planning stages of it, um, how much was cycling? How much was, was dishes? Was it, did you, you picked 21 dishes that you wanted to do? Like, which ones didn't make it in? That, that's... There were quite a few actually that didn't make it in just because France is a country of such culinary wealth and it's a country of such contrast. I mean, the UK is a very long country, but I feel like our cuisine is more standardised than France. But you do get the same things all the way around. But of course, in the Mediterranean, you really are in a, a you know a sunny climate down there in olives. Whereas Brittany is very much like Cornwall. And then you kind of get into the Germanic bit and it's all pork fat. And I think there's a, a famous saying that you can divide France into the quadrants of the fat it uses. You know, butter, lard. Um, goose fat and olive oil and that's just so true so I had a lot to pick from but I wanted it to be um, a good mixture of you know meat um, vegetarian which was harder there are there's ratatouille in the book and there's a salad nichoise which could be vegetarian um, but um, in general there's not a lot of there's french onion soup actually but um, generally contains beef stock anyway um, so I wanted a good mix of that and sweet things and I sort of wanted things, a few things that I didn't know that much about. So um, down in the southwest in Po, I wanted to have a Kulo pot um, just because it, I knew it was this very, very famous dish in France, but I'm not sure that I'd ever actually had one before. Um, and I can't think of a better place to have it than after sort of... Uh, 150 kilometers of in the rain in Po um, and just being welcomed into this little restaurant and being guided through the whole experience by the waiter who clearly thought I was mad. Um, so I want, yeah, I wanted a good mixture of well-known things and stuff that is famous in France, but maybe is less, less well-known here. Um, so yeah, I had to discard quite, quite a lot actually. Um, things like chocolate mousse. I love chocolate mousse, um, but I just couldn't fit it in. I think it was a good mix. And, um, how long did it take to plan that route? Because I, I, I remember when I was reading it, I was thinking cause it, it was very intricate in the way it was designed and going from one place to another and it was really clearly well thought out. How, did, how long did that, did you sit down with a huge map of France picking your, picking your route out? I mean, I'm glad that it seemed well thought out to you because in reality, so I did start, I love maps. So I did go to Stanford's in Covent Garden. I bought um, quite a few maps. I spread them out. But then I realised that trying to, it, it was very difficult to try and, exactly route plan so I put in the places where which I thought I was likely to find you know say the best um crepe I want to do crepe in Brittany and so I found the place that had won you know the the best uh crepery in Brittany five years running which of course happened to be right in Finisterre on the edge of Brittany um in the wild, sort of wild Atlantic coast and so I put that in and then um you know, the place where Tart Tart was invented, etc. So some of them are very specific. Um, and getting from A to B, I wanted to, once I realised, for a long time I thought the Tour de France actually cycled all the way around France, but obviously it hasn't done that for quite a few decades. Um, and they take very luxury buses um, and sort of sometimes even fly, as you'll know, between the different start stages. So I thought, well, if that's the case, and France is the largest country in Western Europe, which I foolishly hadn't realised before committing to this, um, I thought I could take trains. But of course, also being France, there was a train strike that summer. So that complicated a few things. And I ended up doing a few bits where I wasn't intending to cycle it. And I did cycle it. And I realised why I wasn't intending to cycle it, because it was like that. Oh. Um, but yeah, quite a lot of it was just on the hoof because I didn't know exactly where I was going to be the night before and I didn't know which trains were going to be running and yeah, it all worked out. There was only one disaster and that was when I got onto a train in the wrong direction um, and couldn't get to where I needed to be and that was quite chastening. Um, but apart from that, it all seemed, to, it was all worked out relatively smoothly, although it sometimes didn't feel like that. The bad luck with trains becomes kind of more the thematic thing throughout the book, doesn't it? Every <laughs> trains and the weather really were against me. Um, and people, it was because there was a heat wave in the UK in 2018. And so I was getting sent pictures of my dog, you know, sunbathing in the home counties. And I was, you know, in torrential rain on the Côte d'Azur. And it just seemed really, really, really unfair. 
Um, but obviously it makes for some excellent sort of vicarious armchair misery for the reader. It was, it was, yeah, I didn't envy you the rain while I envied so much of the trip. I the <laughs> weather was not one part of that. I, I, on that, so cyclists often see like the struggle as the big achievement, like mm. kind of, uh, that leg crunching climb or, or battling the elements and that kind of thing. Is there a bit of it you look back on now with the biggest sense of pride, like the, the Alp or, or, or like a certain stage of it? Is there something you look back on now and think, I can't believe I did that, I'm glad I did. There is, uh, there was one day and it was a bit that I'd intended to do by train. So it was from Pau to Toulouse. And so it's in the, the very, you know, smallest foothills of the Pyrenees. Um, and I intended to do it by train simply because I needed to be in Toulouse for a certain time for a Catalay appointment. Um, and there were no trains running that day. And again, it was, it was very wet. Um, and the, because it was in the foothills of the Pyrenees, it was just relentless all day. There'd be a sort of very steep climb and then you'd go, you know, for maybe a kilometre flat and then down again and there'd be just enough flat at the bottom that you'd lose all momentum and then you'd be up again. And nothing, it was very, it was quite a remote area and I couldn't find anywhere to buy water or even to ask for water. So I ran out of water. And so I felt like I couldn't cry because I needed the <laughs> liquid. It was just relentless and it was my longest day. I think I ended up doing about 165 kilometers. And bear in mind, I was carrying a tent and et cetera, everything on my back. And I was on my own at that point. That was quite a dark day and it was very wet at the beginning and then very, very hot in the afternoon. Um, and at the time, I was just, you know, it's one of those days where you have to dig very deep into your mental reserves. And I look back at it and think, how did I keep going? But at the time, I was just like, I need to be in Toulouse tomorrow morning. And so I didn't have a choice. And actually, I, I sometimes think of that when I'm doing much more minor hills in the UK. I'm like, you can do this. This is easy. This is fine. You don't have another 150 kilometers to go today. Um, so, yeah, I did feel quite... Um, just, I don't know, in awe of um, the human ability just to keep on ploughing on in the face of pain and mosquito bites. Just keep on cycling up a hill, it is, sometimes it is. I, I've never cycled French hills. The only time I've cycled in France has been Loire, which is lovely and flat and has yeah. nice, nice smooth roads. So I've never, I've never experienced that kind of struggle, so I kind of <laughs> out of it. <laughs> it, has it has to be done. Uh, at some point, I think I've got to, you know, got to, got to do it. Um, the, the book has quite a lot of humour in it as well. I mean, we talk about the trains, which does become kind of a bit of a riff almost <laughs> like the bloody trains again. Um, was it as much fun to write as it as it was to read? It's quite it's, it's, it's quite light, and although there is there are these points of struggle, it's a really fun, uplifting book. Did you feel that when you were writing it as well? Oh, good. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed writing it. Um, just because I loved getting back into the getting back to the places I've been and really reliving it. And I spent quite a lot of time um, just follow it, going on to um, sort of Google Street View and just retracing my steps and picking out little details um, and just recreating the people I met along the way. And yeah, it, I, I really did enjoy, uh, it was just pure escapism writing it as well as doing it. And And the great thing about writing it was that I knew where I was going to sleep that evening and I could just have a cup of tea when I wanted it and things. So there were actual there were improvements and revisiting the scenario. Because when the trip was, people always asked me about saying it must have been so fun. And I say parts of it were fun and it was an incredible, it was an incredible trip, but parts of it were, were really <laughs> quite hard work as well. Um, and yeah, writing it was probably more, more fun. And um, when you're writing, so, um people watching this each chapter of the book has a has a recipe attached to it as well mm. for one of the thing that, that that chapter is based around did you when you got home did you cook all those recipes again did you do because i've got a couple of the perfect books did you go through the same process again of trying to nail the perfect way of cooking that dish yeah so some of the dishes i'd actually done for the perfect column but then i went to um you know i'd done crepe and then i went to speak to christophe the crepier in Brittany, um and found out more about it and decided that it's not that my other one isn't perfect um but here's another way of doing it um and so it just sort of added to my to my sum of knowledge so the birth bag in your recipe in this one 
um, has got some other little touches, like I think it's got some cloves in it and maybe some ginger, I'm trying to remember, um, but just some sweet spices, which is not something I don't think I'd seen in any of the recipes I tried for the perfect column, but was something that I had in a restaurant in Dijon and um, they said was kind of quite medieval in origin, which makes sense. Um, and they served it with these lovely little garlic toasts, which I never would have thought of, um, but were so delicious that I decided to include those as well. And the tart tartan recipe is completely different, um, just because it's based on the one. So in France, they have these wonderful organizations for any sort of food and drink you can imagine, sort of brotherhoods they're generally called. And there's a brotherhood of tart tartan um, based in, in that region, in the um, Salon, which is uh, southwest of Paris sort of big hunting area, lots of forests. And so I got in contact um, with them and spoke to them. And it, it's, you know, it's not better than the one that I wrote, I don't know, seven or eight years ago. It's just, it's different and it's got a different pastry. And I don't know, I don't know which one I prefer, but it is, it, I don't know, it's interesting. Of course, there's, you know, the great thing about recipes is there's no one way to do it. Mm. Um, so yeah, I did learn a lot actually. And it was fun recreating those and trying the kafuti, the cherry kafuti, was hard because actually I didn't get a recipe. I managed to have a quick chat to the boulangerie where I bought the best glafuti, but then I had to go and catch a train. Um, and so it was a real trial and error trying to recreate that really custody sort of glafuti, which was different from the more sort of flat, like Yorkshire pudding type one that I'd done previously. So yeah, that was a challenge as well, a delicious challenge. I do love the fact that the French have these little organizations to protect mm. what I see as like the, 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 the kind of true way of cooking something. So serious as well. I bumped into the um, what was he called? Sort of the grand, the grand high knight or something of the um, the Brotherhood of Brie de Meaux in the Brie Museum in Meaux, and they were wearing these uh, amazing ceremonial robes. There's pictures on my Instagram. These sort of white flowing robes. You know, you would have assumed that they were part of some kind of cult, and then they had these amazing flat, sort of crushed velvet cream hats, which I realised are meant to represent rounds of Brie. And they were just completely serious. This wasn't, a, you know, a joke, a Monty Python thing. This is very serious for these guys. And we had a great conversation about how, yes, you know, the English can make brie, but it's just it's not the same. It's all in the soil. It's all in the soil, apparently. So, yeah. yeah, that was fascinating. I loved it. I love how seriously they take these things. It was wonderful. So what, what about the writing thing? Now, obviously, you're on a bike, so you packed as light as possible. How did you go about it? Were you taking notes as you went round and then typing it up as you went as you went home? Were you writing extensive bits of it as you were as you were stopping in the evenings? Um, so I took notes. I took a notebook, but I was intending to write it on my phone as I went along. So I did actually take a keyboard, like a portable keyboard, with me. But my phone, you know, in the choir of things that went wrong as I went along, the, my phone got waterlogged because it kept um, getting wet because of the rain. Um, and so my phone started really playing up and I realised the keyboard was just ridiculous um, and taking up far too much space. So I gave that to my parents um, when I saw them in the Alps. Um, and, but mostly it was just taking notes, but I didn't have that much time to do that because unless I was on the train, I was mostly sort of planning where mm -hmm. I was going to go the next day, trying to make reservations, meet, you know, try and get people to speak to about whatever it was that I was researching. Um, and so I took loads and loads of photos and actually that's incredibly helpful for jogging other memories. So, you know, if you just take photos of sort of random bits of road or everything you eat, then I, I use that actually much more than I did the notes that I took. Like if I spoke to someone then I'd write down what they said, but for sort of the, the recreating the colour and the landscape, the photos were just amazing. So yeah, I think uh, it would have been much harder in the days of um, non-digital cameras when you couldn't take 500 photos a day. Yeah, and probably sitting there with tons of waterlogged pieces of paper trying yes, to figure exactly. out oh, the stress. from that point onwards. Um, so looking back on it now, do you have a kind of favourite food highlight? Is there something that you, you look back on now? There's like cycling highlights, perhaps going up the Alpes or the, or the amazing day from Po, but... Um, is there a food highlight, something you look back on that you would take a specific trip back to France just to have that dish? Oh, there's a few. Um, the place I'd really like to go back to, actually, because it opened my eyes to, um, again, a side of French cuisine that I hadn't really explored before, was in Lyon. And it was in a bouchon, which are these uh, very traditional 
um, rustic restaurants that, you know, they serve you wine straight from the barrel and it's all very informal, um, kind of, you know, a bit like a pub, but, you know, a French pub. Um, and the traditional cuisine there is very, um, I guess they describe it as peasant, sort of very hearty, very meat and offal focused. Um, and I'm not squeamish about offal, but I, you know, I'm not the biggest fan of eating it, but I always try to, you know, I try everything just to see if I like it yet. And we had an andouillette there, which is an infamous French sausage um, that I feel like you do have to be born into, like Marmite, to love. But it's got a very particular manure-like odour. And obviously it's incredibly popular. There is a society of uh, andouillette fanciers. Um, and when we went to the Bouchon, we ordered absolutely everything on the menu, you know, deep fried tripe, um, a tête de veau, all of this stuff. And it was all delicious. But the Andriette came out and I felt a particular kind of British, you know, a pride, national pride was at stake. And so I was thinking, and there were, I think, six of us at that point. So, you know, we can make a good dent in it, but we'd completely overordered. And I thought, I will finish this on duet if it kills me, because I feel like they must have British people in here the whole time ordering it and then going, oh. And actually, luckily, this particular andouillette, it wasn't too manure but also it came in this lovely sharp mustard sauce and it was quite crisp. It was like, um, it was like a white pudding or something that had been uh, sort of fried in slices. And actually, it was quite delicious and it wasn't a problem to, to finish. But I'd like to go back to Lyon and see more of that side of things because I was only there for a night. Um, yeah, I just felt a pride. I felt like I'd cracked something about French cuisine and I didn't know whether it's because... I'd been there for so long by that point that I'd become, my taste had gone native or whether that was just particularly good on Viet, but I'd like to go back and explore that a bit further. Excellent. I, I think when, when I was reading, I think the book does a really good job of making food, uh, understanding food, food writing and, and cooking it really accessible and interesting and engaging and really rooted, rooted to, the, to the place it's from. So with that in mind, have you got plans to do the same for other nations? I was thinking like of a, Giro of cannolis or something. Yeah. Um the problem I have with that, and I would love to do that, I don't speak any Italian or Spanish or a tiny bit of Spanish. And I don't know whether it would be a problem. I mean my French isn't fluent, but it's good enough to, you know, to go and do a tour of a shoe croup factory in Alsace. Right. Um and I don't know whether it would be a problem not being able to chat to people in that way, whether they put a certain amount of distance between us. Um, but yeah, I would really like to do that. And I'd like to do other countries like Germany, I feel has got a really underappreciated cuisine in this country. Um, and I'd love to do the States. I think that would be absolutely incredible. Um, and, you know, you know, disprove all of these myths that, you know, the States doesn't have good proper cooking. Um, and then the UK, I'd sort of got vague plans to do something similar in the UK. I did the Hebridean Way last September. And I have to say, even though the Hebrides, the Outer Hebrides is a very remote and, um, you know, sparsely populated place, it was a lot easier to get food in the Outer Hebrides than it was in some parts of France. It was just, there was always somewhere open that would serve you a scone or a black pudding roll or, you know, etc. Um, and I thought maybe there's something in that, you know, parts of the UK that I don't know so well. Um, so, yeah, I'm not quite sure where, where it's going to take me next, but hopefully, hopefully I'll be off again soon. And that'll be back on the bike. Your bike's called, it's Eddie, isn't it? Eddie after Eddie Merckx, yeah. 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 So, so they'll be back on the bike again, going around another country, figuring out what they eat. Yeah, it, yeah, I do. Um, yeah, I am really, really looking forward to that. I did a little trip last weekend down to Devon and we just did a mini coast to coast in Devon. And it was just so nice to be back sort of trying to find the best scone or the best ice cream. And I thought, yeah, this, this, I feel like this is my calling in life, my destiny. <laughs> Bringing together cycling, tourism and, and gastronomy in that kind of way. Yes, exactly. Yes. Okay. And so the, the book title is obviously, so I, I remember uh, on Instagram seeing the, the sort of one more croissant for the road hashtag emerge while you were doing, doing the trip and then it turned into the book. So I think, um, we have to know what the scoring metric is for the croissants that comes up <laughs> in the book, and I think it's really important that people thinking about reading this must understand the importance of the croissant in there. So yeah, the croissant is the thing that ties it all together. Um, 
so I, when I was doing the, the trip in 2017, just, just for fun, um, I started rating croissants every morning just because that was what we ate for breakfast every morning. And I'm a massive food nerd. And so I just decided for fun to do it. And um, people seemed really interested by it. And so then every time I had a croissant on this trip, I did a little rating of it. It was surprisingly hard to get croissants. I think I only had 34 or 35 which actually isn't great for seven weeks, but sometimes there was just nothing open. Anyway, so I rate them and it's not, I'm, I think that my rating system would horrify sort of patisserie experts, but it, you know, it's based on my preference. I'm eating the croissant. Um, and so I obviously give a, a couple of points uh, for appearance, but that's not so important. Um, but you do want it to look a little bit golden if possible but not burnt. And then it's very big. I think texture is almost the most important thing for it with a croissant. So I like it to be really crisp at the ends and on the bottom, um, but a, just a little bit squidgy in the middle, which I think is probably technically a fault, but I like it, you know, a tiny bit doughy. And then it should taste really buttery and, you know, not too sweet, not too sort of savory, a bit of a mix, but yeah, the butter is the most important flavor. Um, and I had some great ones and I had some absolute shockers. But the great thing about croissant in France is that they're never more than, I think the most expensive one I have, which was in a really shishi boutique uh, boulangerie in Paris was maybe one euro 60. So if it's bad, it's, you know, it's not the worst thing in the world. You just feed it to a, you know, passing dog or whatever and get on, get on with your day. But it was fun. Yeah. Did, did any, now from, from memory from the book, nothing got a 10, did it? No, I don't think I've ever given a 10 because I feel like, the te you know, you've always got to be reaching for perfection. But there are a couple in Paris that I think probably approach that. And one thing I would love to do when travel is a bit easier is take the best croissants that I found in my, um, you know, locality in London. So they're super fresh and take them on the first Eurostar of the day and stack them up against the best Parisian ones and do a kind of battle of the croissant. Um, but yeah, that's <laughs> that's a very nerdy pipe dream. I think that sounds like a fun idea. Um, and it, so, is it possible to get one that sort of approaches the nine uh, from France in the UK? Where where did where do you go around the UK for them? Um, so I've had some really really great ones. I had a great one in the Forest of Dean recently. Strangely enough, someone recommended it. I was on holiday there and someone recommended it and I saw, I think I ended up cycling about 40k to get this croissant um, before breakfast while the rest of my family were asleep um, but that was superb I think it might have been called Hacks, Hacksby Bakehouse um, but in London there's some there's some really um, super ones and there's one actually I live very near King's Cross so this would be very handy for getting Eurostar from St Pancras there's a little French bakery on the Gray's Inn Road that is not at all glamorous um you, you would just walk right past it um I think it's called Or or Père de Papy and it does really great croissants and I think they're maybe one pound ten or something and they're just fabulous um, and Yotto Mottolenghi's ones are surprisingly good as well because he said he said that um, he told me that he actually started off as a pastry chef and so even though we think of him as you know Mr Aubergine salad and meringues and stuff mm. the croissants are one of the things that he really cares about getting right and so his croissants are superb unexpectedly. Brilliant well I will bear all those <laughs> I know Andy of Papi quite well actually I work just up the road from it so I'm ah, yes. really to be found in there by any sorts of um, so just before we um, let you go, what's next for you as a writer? You talked about uh, other books, that kind of thing. What, what, what's next? Are you going back to the Perfect series? Uh, yeah, so I'm still doing the, um, the Perfect series. So that is continuing and continued through lockdown, which was fun getting ingredients. Um, and yeah, hopefully another book, I'll start on another book um, next year. It was meant to be this year, but clearly... Um, that hasn't happened for obvious reasons. Um, so yeah, I think just more, um, more food and more travel, I think is in my, well, I'm hoping more travel, certainly more food is in my future. Um, but yeah, fingers crossed, whether that's in the UK or further afield, but yeah, hopefully on two wheels. I'm watching the Tour de France at the end of this month. When it yes, I'm excited about that. I'm really excited about that. Um, obviously I did have some, some plans to go out and see, I wanted to see the mountain stages this year or some of the mountain stages, the alpine stages. Um, but I don't think that's going to be possible, sadly. Um, but next year, one day I will go out and see other people suffering on a hill instead. But yeah, in the meantime, I'll just sit on my sofa and, you know, eat cakes and watch the pros. Brilliant. 
Brilliant. Well, thanks very much for your time, Felicity. Um, for, for watchers, the book is a really good, fun jaunt around France. If you're a cyclist or into your food or anything like that, I think you'd really enjoy this. It's uplifting. And while we can't travel and the Tour de France is going to have no fans at it, this is a, a great way to experience all those all those wonderful things we get in the summer when we watch that when we watch that bike race. So uh, thanks very, very much for your time. I hope the book does really, really well in paperback. Thank you. Bon route. And we'll pass back to Ben now. Massive thanks to Felicity and to Jamie for that wonderful interview. One more quest of the roads available in our bookshop. Give us a call on 01442 827 653. All other purchase blurb is in the text below this video. Thank you again for joining us. We've got so many more author interviews to come. Uh, do subscribe to our YouTube channel and we'll see you soon.